We have in a month the inflation that regular countries or first world countries have in, in a year. People started going well into Bitcoin. Some Argentina will be the first major country to adopt a Bitcoin standard. Argentina was full of ridiculous all kinds of laws, all kinds of regulations, all, all kinds of taxes, restrictions. It was going towards a Venezuela. If I can freely choose in Austria between having Bitcoin or having Euro as a currency, I would choose Bitcoin all the time. Argentines are suffering a lot. Like that salary I told you that was a thousand dollars five years ago. Now Argentines are making like three hundred dollars a month. How would you survive with ten euros a day? This is the sad story of how fiat can destroy a nation. A lot of Russians now are going to Argentina to have babies and and get an Argentine passport. Even some Americans are, are going to Argentina. So that, that's blowing my mind, like Americans trying to have an Argentine passport. Last year I went in November and I was able to fill the gas tank of the car for $12. A few months later, you would take three times as much dollars, 36, to fill the car. Having to pay three times as much in dollars, it's tough. For the today's topic, uh, I really want to get into Argentina. It's really interesting with, with uh, Javier Mele. I think we all really watched the election of him really, really closely. After that, also a little bit, but the uh, focus has uh, drifted away a little bit. Um, but before we get into the current topic, uh, I think you're also really big on the history of, of Argentina and the financial history. Um, maybe for those who are not as aware of the history and, and how is Argentina doing and, and what they did in the in the past um what were some of the the major events and and what wh why is argentina now in the situation they it's a really long story i'd say but we should start uh, also considering argentina as a country that became a world superpower uh, around the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century so it was on par with the united states and canada australia right but that was uh, accomplished in a very few decades. Uh, Argentina was really poor, like in 1810, uh, 1820s, and, and so on. Uh, we saw ourselves as barbarians or savages. Uh, very few people knew how to read or write. Uh, we got independent from the Spaniards, but then we started fighting each other over, like, this centralization or decentralization problems. So it's uh, quite funny that we're always on the same topic, like uh, how centralized the government should be, right? Uh, but fortunately, Argentina had a generation of uh, founding fathers that were classical liberals, and they in uh, enacted a, a classical liberal constitution, 1853 it was. Uh, and ever since the country started like well recognizing private property rights uh, recognizing that foreigners have the same rights as citizens and that argentina was open and welcoming everybody to come and live like the argentinian dream let's say oh yeah like uh, europeans when they were fleeing europe in the 20th century uh, well they they, they either chose new york or buenos aires uh, as destinations but the thing was in the 20th century, Argentina started to change. Uh, a lot of poor immigration from Spain and Italy. They brought new ideas of, well, anarcho-communism, communism, socialism. So we lost, by 1930, uh, we started having military coups. So no more yeah, regular presidents, democracy. And those military were f fascinated with Mussolini and uh, Hitler, right? So also five years later, they put the first central bank, 1935. So up until 1935, Argentina did not have a central bank. Um, for some periods, we had a gold standard. But whenever there was a crisis, they would take out the gold standard. And uh, also at the same time, they e e established the income tax. So it's quite similar to what happened in the United States. Like 1913 or 1914, they, they come together, right? Like central bank plus uh, income tax. And that income tax was like supposed to be temporary, like 10 years. And they've been renewing that every 10 years, right? Uh, renewing the, the, the income tax. So... 
the, well, the country started on this decline up until there's a breaking point, I would say, that um, general in the military, he became Minister of Labor, eh, Juan Domingo Perón, right? Eh, he, uh, well, perhaps some people have heard about Perón. And this uh, military, he realized the power of uh, being uh, a populist, being like, a, because uh, as being a minister of labor, he had to deal with unions and, and uh, yeah, businessmen and the workers. And he realized since we are in a democracy, we, we can get the votes of the majority. And so he started a, a pitch about uh, yeah, uh, workers' rights and, and so on. And he got a, a girlfriend that she was an actress aspiring uh, on the on the apps coming up, and Evita, and, and she was like a modern day social social justice warrior, right? Uh, Evita. So they partnered together. Well, they won the military. At first, they tried to stop Peron. Uh, they put him in jail. But eventually Evita was on the radio calling from him. And so they call elections, he won, they became presidents. And that's when Argentina, 1947 or so, started changing. Uh, they nationalized almost everything, became part of the state. So the, the central bank became part of the state. The railroads, the power generation, phone companies, airlines... Everything became part of the state. And there were tales that they say that uh, the central bank aisles were so full of gold that you couldn't walk on the aisles, right? But by the time Perón had finished his... Uh, or they, they took him out, actually. Uh, second Monday, the, the aisles were empty. Like, all the gold was gone. So the next few decades were a succession of either democracy on off coming back to military coups up until 1983 so this has been going on from 1930 till 1983 and ever since 1970 right around the time that nixon took us of the gold standard in the dollar argentina started a monetary disaster because uh, we had a, the first currency of argentina was called a peso, moneda, nacional, national currency, let's say peso. It lasted from 1881 until 1970. But then, and I should have it, I, I always carried with me the, the bills, right? The 100 of pesos, moneda, nacional, became one peso ley, like a low peso, this is a peso ley. And this one lasted 13 years, right? So we, yeah, it was, it got up to 1 million peso notes. And in 83, we did the Falklands War, 82, and we lost the war, right? And so the military were out and they had to take four zeros out of this one. So 10,000 of this one became an Argentine peso, which is really similar, but now it says Argentino here. And this one they destroyed in two years. Total disaster. <laughs> like you make a new currency and it's gone in two years. 85, right? So this was a return to democracy. And this guy was left leaning, the president, yeah, from the left. He got Keynesian politics. So he had to replace the currency and he proposed what was called the Austral Plan. The, a new currency, uh, Austral comes means from the south, like Australia. So when this currency was born, it was more precious than one dollar. Eighty-three cents of an Austral bought you a dollar. How many years do you think <laughs> it took us for <laughs> to to be in hyperinflation again? Like, I mean, the the first uh, the two years, uh, I guess, uh, in a similar round. Well, it was four years. So 89, by 1989, we were in hyperinflation again, destroying this one. So the, the president that did this, they had six, six year terms back then. 
well, he called elections in advance to, to leave office. Right? The, the situation was so bad. So a new president that came from the political party of Perón, right, got into power and it's like that political party is the main party now of Argentina, right? The Peronism. But Peronism it doesn't mean actually anything. I mean, ideologically. Like, uh, it might mean populism, but we had periods of time when Perón was a military, like, fascist. And then in the 70s, there were uh, Peronist fanatics that were, like, communists and socialist uh, advocates. And they wanted to replicate Cuba. They wanted to have Cuba in Argentina, right? Uh, and they became terrorists in the 70s. Uh, and then this president in 89, he came through the Peronist political party. But uh, after Millet, he was the most like libertarian ever. <laughs> so if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be talking about Argentina right now because... Argentina would have gone insignificant uh, much sooner. Like um, he opened up the economy. We have to also bear in mind that the world was going towards freedom back then because the Berlin Wall fell in '89. The Soviet Union dissolved. Uh, Thatcher and Reagan had lower taxes, right? And so the sentiment was going towards more freedom. And Bill Clinton was somewhat, no, 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 not like the Democrats of today, right? So he opened up the country, he privatized all the state companies, and, and he opened Argentina to the world. Like I sometimes tell that, uh, for example, the cars in Argentina, we had the same cars from 1960. So they were still being manufactured in 1991. Right, cars from 1967, with minor minor modifications. Right, like you change a light and, and that's it. The phones, you would have to ask, ask the state for a phone line. It would take like ten years for the state to install a phone line in your home. And when this president privatized it, it was just a, like two days. Right, from so we went from like ten years to two two days, and people. Uh, so a house with a phone line would be much more valuable than a house without a phone line, right? Uh, so, so yeah, we were isolated. We, we had, from the universities and the media, they have always taught us that we have to live with what is ours. We have to live uh, within our means of uh, buying Argentine. So foreign products were really hard to get. Right, uh, and so when I tell this story, I realize, oh my God, like we were like a Soviet Union country, right? Uh, no wonder we we started falling down the positions of of countries, and relatively, yeah, we've been getting more and more poor. But the nineties, this guy, this president, he said he, he established sort of like a USDT. A tether, because he said, whenever the exchange rate between dollars and pesos becomes one dollar ten thousand australis, right? He would kick in convertibility law, which is like a peg, uh, a one to one. So this peso convertible, they needed a dollar in the central bank or a treasury bill or whatever in order to print. One of these. So Argentina self-restricted the money printing. This is the only period where we had 10 years of almost practically zero, zero inflation. No, no inflation. And that was when I was growing up. So that's what I experienced. Prices not changing. Uh, stability. The economy, for a few periods, it was booming. Like We were growing like at Chinese rates. Money was flowing. The recessions in other countries like Mexico in the 95 and Thailand in, or Russia in 99, well, they re really hit us. Uh, and this president, uh, he lasted 10 years in office, right? Uh, he even attempted... No, yeah, he, he lasted 10 years. 
the next president was sort of like a Biden, right? Like a Joe Biden. He was really old. He got lost on stage. And that president uh, raised taxes and the country went into a recession. We couldn't print money, so we had to borrow. They, they, they started doing deficit spending. Uh, well, even the, the, this libertarian president also did deficit spending. But uh, eventually we knew that the country was going towards a default. We reached a crisis. They did... Um, they, 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 because they, they were, the banks were going to implode. So they decided, okay, before this happens, we're going to restrict people from taking the money out of the banks, right? Uh, you were only allowed $250 a week to withdraw. Everything else had to stay inside of the banking system. Everything had to be wire transfer, check, uh, debit cards, credit cards. So people started rioting, people started uh, because they knew they were going to lose all their savings. And the president decided to do, to do like a curfew at night. You couldn't leave your house. Uh, people rioted even more. Uh, they were looting, people stealing from shops. And eventually that president resigned. He, he, he escaped, the, a helicopter landed on the roof of our White House. He escaped through the roof. He flew off. We didn't know where he was going. And we had no vice president back then. He had resigned prior. And eventually, well, we had a succession of presidents. And those presidents decided to end the convertibility and uh, to declare default. So we were no longer going to pay our debts to anybody. And Argentina has been on default like for 15 years, ever since we got off default, I know, like 2015, I'm not sure, right? But around that time. And ever since we started inflating. So right now, instead of one peso, one dollar, we need over a, a thousand pesos for a dollar, right? So we have already taken 13 zeros out of the currency. We should be able to take three more zeros, so 16 zeros in total. Uh, and we would be around one to one again. So yeah, this is why Argentines uh, have a yeah, disastrous economics. They don't trust the banks. People don't hold dollars in banks. Like if you have a no, $100,000, you're not going to put it in the bank. Like uh, it has happened many times that, that yeah they, they will tell you back in 2002 they gave people who had dollars they gave them pesos so if you had a hundred thousand dollars in the bank uh, after the crisis they would say now you have a hundred and forty thousand pe pesos zero dollars all the ba dollar bank accounts went to zero for all the country all the companies all the everybody right and they gave you 140,000 pesos. But the free market exchange rate was 4 to 1. So uh, if you wanted to, with the 140,000 pesos buy back dollars, you would get 35,000, right? So people lost 65% of all their money in that crisis. Yeah. So from 2003, Argentina has been on a leftist agenda government, raising taxes, doing more deficit spending. We did sort of a UBI really early on because we decided to pay for children and pay yeah, for a lot of uh, disabilities and, and so on, or, or unemployed payments. So a, a poor family, they could yeah, gather many children and gather... Uh, many unemployed members and get certified as disabled and so on, and they would make much, much more money than somebody working. And so I, I don't have the numbers like uh, on the top of my head, but it's something like, I don't know, let's say, let's say that a third of the population was on welfare, 
a third of the population was working uh, in the black market, so they don't have a formal job contract and they're not paying taxes. And a third of the population is paying taxes, supporting the, the people on welfare, right? So yeah, it's a whole sus unsustainable situation that was paid for by money printing. So everybody paid for it through money printing. So at first it was like 10% inflation, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Uh, and we reached over 100% a few, a few years ago. And yeah, so I, I tell you all of these stories so that we can be like in the context of what the Argentine situation is and, and to see why Argentines, for example, we really got into Bitcoin and, and understood the need for it really early. Like 2013, 2014, Argentina was uh, had a lot of Bitcoiners, right? Um, we had exchange controls, like from 2011, so we are we were not able to freely buy uh, dollars with our pesos, right? So Argentina is used to having uh, uh, informal operations. We could call the black market operations, but the whole country. Uh, operates in the black market. Everybody, right? Uh, even the politicians, uh, the businessmen, the families, the poor people, they go to a cueva. A cueva is a cave in, in, in Spanish. It's a, any kind of place that sells you and buys dollars and pesos, right? And it could be any, it could be a restaurant, it could be a travel agency is really common. Uh, it could be an antique shop. It could be the guy that uh, copies the keys to your house. He's a cueva, right? And he's having a few dollars under the table and he will exchange it for you. So this is keeping the country functioning. Uh, if it wasn't for the cueva system, let's say, the, the country would collapse immediately, right? Because people need a better currency than one that is self-destroying all the time. We have, in a month, the inflation that regular countries or first world countries have in, in a year, right? So it's really common for prices up until, yeah, a year ago, perhaps prices would ra raise once a month. But um, lately, they were raising every two weeks, every week, change it, prices would change, right? And I, I was too little, but people that le lived in hyperinflation in Argentina, uh, prices would change many times during the day. People, whenever they got some cash, pesos, they would run to spend it or run to buy dollars. So we became uh, a country that saves in dollar physical cash. And it's a cash culture. So whenever we buy a house, or we buy a used car or whatever, we pay with cash. We did not have a mortgage market because of all this disaster. So when people want to buy a house in Argentina, they have a suitcase of $300,000 or $100,000, half a million, whatever. We count it on a table. We have a notary, a guy that signs all the contracts, or he he's a witness to the contracts. And the other person lives with the with the suitcase, right? Um, that's how Argentines pay each other. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I love that a lot. Uh, the cash culture, but uh, I, I guess Bitcoin would be more efficient. <laughs> than... Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's interesting for for me. Like I think uh, all the things that you said shows one thing really clearly. Like not even only for Argentina, but for globally, what can happen with fiat. Like a lot of people, especially if they live like now in the US or in Europe or somewhere where the currency is not like where the currency is kind of stable, uh, even though it's inflating uh, still a lot, uh, which is also interesting because you compare it to the dollar over the th those years, but even the dollar inflated a lot, like even that is like you, you have to <laughs> double yeah, that and it, again. It lost 99% uh, of all its purchasing power. Had it's, uh, that's, that's massive. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like in the dollar compared then to, to the peso and the Argentina currencies over the time, it's like, uh, that's, 
that's massive. But it shows how how weak and how unstable uh, fiat currencies are that that can happen to USA and and, and uh, Austria and 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 uh, uh, Europe and all all the countries where the people most of the people don't think right now that it can happen. Like when I go out in the streets and when I go out uh, out in my normal world, they're like, yeah, we have transitory uh, inflation a little bit but it, it comes down again and like people are not aware that that problem can actually like really accelerate and can be a, a major thing that hurts the economy and hurts the people uh, living mm -hmm. uh, thing yeah we, we shouldn't tolerate any inflation because even if inflation is two percent or three percent or whatever it's still a system like michael saylor would say that trends towards uh, nothingness. I, say, I mean, uh, eventually, you, 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 are, you are destroying all the value. Even if it goes slowly, it's, uh, yeah, there's no other direction than, than that one, right? Uh, so the other possibility is, is a system that somehow remains at zero or a, a system like Bitcoin that it's uh, deflationary uh, in nature. And I, I, I wrote recently, well, a book about Bitcoin in Argentina, right? And I did a calculation, like, uh, how, how, like let's say that your grandfather, he was the richest Argentine to have ever lived, right? And the what the politicians in Argentina say is that you 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 have to save in Argentine currency. I mean, you have to. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find it, but I don't know where this is. <laughs> you have to save in Argentine currency because otherwise you're unpatriotic, right? Uh, you're uh, like a economic terrorist or, or whatever. But the thing is that if your grandfather was the richest Argentine ever and he complied with what the politicians ask of you, uh, every successive co uh, government would tell him, please give us your uh, previous currency and we're going to replace it for the new one. So you would end up with less than a US penny. Like you, you start in the trillions of pesos, which was like an impossibility. Okay, if, if this is, there were not enough pesos back then. And when you start taking out the zeros and taking out the zeros, etc., you reach, uh, yeah, like one peso. And one peso right now is uh, uh, like four. No, it's like a, yeah, it's like less than ten percent of a penny. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Yeah. It, show, it shows how how bad inflation like and you said it right like even a little bit inflation like even 0.1 percent inflation uh would be too much even though it w would be probably um not that um feelable for most people but like one percent two percent and then we come to the uh levels where we are right now with 10 15 20 percent where when you have a really good currency uh and then there's like 50 or 100 percent or like even even over 100 percent that's that's really bad but what i'm um uh, also curious what did change actually since javier Mollet uh now is in there because i think one of his big things that he always talked about is he wants to have a free competition around currencies Uh, mm -hmm. that he likes Bitcoin, but he wants a free competition uh, and that he wants to demolish the, the, the central banks and a lot of other institutions in uh, Argentina. That's kind of what, what I heard uh, from him, uh, someone that is living in Europe and is uh, far away from Argentina. Right. So, well, the, the story with Javier is he was a regular economist, uh, like at least not so much Keynesian, but he was a, let's say, Chicago School of Economics, right, monetarist. Perhaps he uh, he knew Milton Friedman, but he had never heard about the Austrians or, yeah, the libertarians. And somebody in 2014, he they gave him uh, Rothbard and Mises. He really liked the, um, the books. And... He his somewhat compulsive behavior. He went to a library and bought all the books he could find on Austrian economics. Uh, he recently told the story. They gave him a, an award in Germany in Hayek a Foundation or Society. I'm not sure the name. And you can look this up. It's on YouTube. There's a talk Javier gave uh, when they gave him the award, right? Hayek Institute. So he tells the whole story. How he got a, like, he locked himself up in the apartment for two weeks reading all the books, right? Uh, like a complete book nerd. And well, he came out uh, an Austrian. And back then, uh, I have this, uh, well, uh, I won't say connection, but he started adding on Facebook. He was like any regular guy like us, right? So, Uh, he started adding libertarians on Facebook and he added me on Facebook, right? Uh, back in 2014. So he sent me a message. Thank you for accepting my friend request. Cheers, JM, right? And at first, well, I didn't know much about him, but he started going to radio stations, doing radio programs. But since 2014, I have been trying to orange build him. Like I sent him a, a, a link to a, a talk I gave and I have on YouTube, and but uh, back then I also thought he was crazy. <laughs> uh, like he started talking about, yeah, uh, large purchases of Bitcoin. And when I first saw him in person, he he was like with a shirt and swimming swimming pads, uh, swimming shorts underneath, like this mismatch, right? Uh, between what's up and down. So yeah, I didn't like follow up uh, and and kept trying. But yeah, he continued doing the proof of work, let's say he continues nonstop going to TV channels. He eventually got into national TV. And, and I guess that the reason why he became so popular is because he put a, a lot of passion Right, the Argentines love passion. We love football. We love, uh, I know, rock music or whatever. Right. So, I believe it was a break from what we call cocktail realism. <laughs> the people that only meet in, yeah, like high society uh, cocktails and and finger food. So, 
nobody expected him to be so popular. Uh, but in the pandemic, he decided he wanted to run for deputy. And he got a lot of votes. I, I, don't, I don't remember if it was 13%, 15, 15, yeah, like around 13.5% of all the votes. They were expecting him to get like 3%, 5%. Right, so it was a huge news. He didn't have a political party, so he had to, yeah, make a coalition of other parties uh, for him to be able to run. And uh, the same thing happened two years later when he ran for president in the primaries in Argentina. We have a, a primary election system that is like mandatory. We have to vote on the primaries, and in the primaries he got in first place. He got like 30% of all the votes in the primary. So that was also a shock to, to a lot of people. They weren't expecting that. When we had the actual election, he came in second. But since the, the distance between the first and the second is so tight, there's a rerun of the election by law, right? A ballotage, they call it. So in the rerun, he won. Right, he got a fifty-six percent, something like this. So it's also quite an interesting phenomenon that I was there when he did his inaugural speech in, uh, yeah, the, the main square in front of Congress, and uh, he was telling people, "Okay, we don't have any more money. Uh, we're gonna have a really hard time for the next few months. Uh, we're gonna suffer more." And people were, "Yeah." <laughs> Okay, we're gonna suffer more. So it's uh, not many politicians can do that, right? Not many politicians can tell, give a this kind of message uh, instead of telling people, "Yeah, I'm gonna fix everything." But I guess Argentines got used to for the last twenty years. Uh, each year that comes is worse than the previous. So it's really tough on people, right? Imagine if your life, instead of becoming better through the years, no, it's uh, it's always getting harder. Because this year you have 10% inflation, but next year you have 15, and next year you have 20, and next year you have 30, and 40, and 50, and 60, and 70, right? And your, if you have a salary, it's not going up as fast as the, as the inflation. So... To give you an example, in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, an Argentine salary was like, let's say, $1,000 a month. So that could be on par with some European, poor poor European country, right? I don't know, Portugal, Spain, I know. some people make 1,000 euros. Okay. On the day that we had primary elections in 2019... The, first, the person that came on top was Alberto Fernandez, which was from the left. So during the night of the Sunday and the morning of the Monday, we could see, thanks to the crypto market, like the USD exchange to pesos, that the USD exchange rate was, instead of 40 pesos to a dollar, it was going towards 60 so it's really funny that in TV media in Argentina, they needed to start talking about the crypto exchange rate, the crypto dollar, right? They, they call it. Because it was an, a measure of what was going on in the market at night when all the markets are closed. And the next day, the market went to 60. So the exchange rate fell from 40 pesos to 60 pesos to a dollar. So by next Monday, salaries, instead of being $1,000 a month, they were around $650 a month. So just like that, you lose like 33% of all your salary in one day, right? All because everybody decided to vote, uh, yeah, leftist government. And that meant uh, Alberto, in the main election, he won. So he got the administration, the, the government, with a dollar rate at 60. Four years later, he gave the government uh, to Milei with a black market rate of 1,200. 
So going from 60 to 1,200 in four years, uh, it's like a 95%. Uh, Argentines all, only kept 5% of, of their value in, in four years. So this is why, yeah, in the pandemic, people started going well into Bitcoin, USDT, DeFi. Sadly, yeah, DeFi started becoming more popular and people wanted to get rich quick. And they saw this uh, Luna scam yielding 20% per year. And a, a lot of people got uh, wrecked by Luna and UST. And the Cuevas, yeah, this, let's say, parallel banking system we have, they started also using USDT, right? Uh, Cuevas that have for 30, 40, 50 years been using only peso and dollar. Now they started offering their clients or even between themselves, if they want to pay the between themselves, they could pay uh, by, by sending a USDT transfer. So, so yeah, now we're in a situation with Javier that um, he still doesn't have many deputies and senators. He got a, the idea of pushing a new law that he called the omnibus law. It meant like, it's a law that's so big as a bus, right? So it has 600 articles modifying hundreds of laws all at once. It took him like six to seven months to to pass this law. They, they wouldn't let him, right? They were, at first they would approve the law in general, but then when they started going article by article, they started taking out all the good articles. And so he said at first, screw it, I'm not pushing this law, I am withdrawing the law, and then he proposed another one. So, But well, eventually he got a sort of version of this, passed, and so it's still quite hard for him to to make a lot of modifications, but every, every I'm watching yeah, Twitter, X, and you can see that every day they're taking out some regulation, some Argentina was full of ridiculous, all kinds of laws, all kinds of regulations, all, all kinds of taxes, restrictions. Like I say, it was going towards a Venezuela or it was going towards a Soviet Union country, right? But the sad aspect is that still Argentina has, doesn't have monetary freedom. I thought that he would take the restrictions like from day one, right? They, uh, oh, I'm I'm letting you buy and sell dollars freely, but in 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 legal terms, it's not there yet. Uh, the restrictions are still there yet. He has some some excuses. He says he keeps right. So he says, oh no, I'm I'm doing this because I need to clean up the balance sheet the balance sheet of the central bank. Uh, the previous administration would say, oh, I, I gave you a central bank with, I don't know, 10 billion. And Millet says, no, you gave me a central bank with minus 10 billion. It's, in, it's totally broke in the negative, right? Uh, it's like if we didn't have it. So he says he's, yeah, taking this time to gather billions of dollars in the coffers. And then he says... He, he will open up all the restrictions and then he says he will give us monetary freedom and that's when we can put Bitcoin inside of that. Like he has given some examples because people ask him, uh, even we have a, a foreign minister, yeah, foreign affairs minister. She's a woman, Diana Mondino, and Diana uh, is a Bitcoiner like from 10 years ago. She understands Bitcoin, uh, and she sometimes, whenever she can, yeah, she she says, "You are you're going to be able to use Bitcoin and so on." But so so yeah, we we will see. my 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 conclusion would be, we still have to wait a bit. There are many forces acting against him, uh, all the media, all the uh, universities and college professors, some yes yeah, union leaders. You could say some. A protectionist businessmen, right, that have always throughout their lives dealt uh, through favors with the state, 
well, they want him out, right? And they're trying everything in their power for him to fail and for him to leave office. Uh, Argentines like this idea of failing presidents that we need to have them removed. So yeah, it's a really tough situation to be in. He has to push and sustain himself. Also next year, uh, October, I guess, we have midterm elections. So we, we should see if he gets more deputies and more senators. We can measure the support he still has. Because still, Argentines are suffering a lot. Like that salary I told you that was a thousand dollars five years ago. Now Argentines are making like three hundred dollars a month. So imagine going from a thousand to ten dollars a day, right? Uh, how would you survive with ten euros a day? How how much can you save, like to buy a house? Like if you are a genius, you can save I don't know fifty euros a month, right? So how 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 can you come up with? Uh, Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollar a year. So, so yeah, the situation is really bad. If Argentina doesn't start growing soon, uh, yeah, we, we cannot know how much people uh, can tolerate the situation, and they, they they want the situation to explode on him. And then the left will say, "See, this was liberalism. This was libertarianism at, at work. Everything explodes when you try this." And we have to go back to socialism, right? To populism. So yeah, we we are walking a really fine line in Argentina. So it it could go like if he's successful, successful Argentina is gonna be yeah a great country to be in with a lot of freedom, welcoming libertarians. But if he fails, we we will continue down the downwards path that we've been on. Like if the other candidate had won. Sergio Massa, now the salaries would be at a hundred dollars a month, and then eventually you go to fifty, and then you're Venezuela. In Venezuela and Cuba, people are making fifty, thirty dollars a month, right? So one dollar a day. So, so yeah, this is the sad so story of how fiat can destroy a nation, right? a country, a society. It all breaks <laughs> down. Do you think that there is a chance that when Javier Malé is uh, successful, that Argentina might even be one of the first major countries? Because like El Salvador is, <laughs> is a lot smaller than Argentina, yeah. uh, that uh, Argentina will be the first major country to, to adopt a, a Bitcoin standard or maybe just like have Bitcoin as a very legal form and as a very... Um, a widespread form of uh, currency? Well, the thing is, I, I don't think Javier will do like what a Bukele did of doing a legal tender. It's most likely that he removes like legal tender laws. Like, like there's no official currency of the land, something like this. Because, yeah, I, I, I have been trying. I met Javier many times through... Through the years, we, he, he was going to Austrian economic conferences, uh, libertarian meetups, right? Whenever I approach him and try to talk to him about Bitcoin, you could, you could speak to him like for two minutes and then he would say, yes, uh, Bitcoin is a private money. I am all in for private monies, right? And, and he goes away. He, he doesn't want to know more. Like... Uh, He doesn't care to more, no, no more. So he does not know the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, like uh, why proof of work is better than proof of stake, uh, what a hash function is, or the, the difficulty adjustment mechanism, right? Well, I, I don't guess he, he, he has all of this in mind. I'm not sure he will advocate Bitcoin over any other crypto. So <clears throat> he, he, he will give us the freedoms. I believe that that is it. Right, we we haven't orange peeled him enough, like to be a bukele but or I, to I be a Michael with, Saylor. Uh, but but I I guess with if if there's like true freedom around currencies and around which asset to choose to to, to buy your assets from, then in a free market uh, long term, Bitcoin succeeds in there. I, like if I, if I can freely choose in Austria between having Bitcoin as a, uh, a currency or having Euro as a currency, 
uh, with like there's a regulatory no um, difference between that. I would choose Bitcoin all the time. Like I, I would love to pay everything in Bitcoin if there's mm -hmm. no capital gains tax, if there's not not other things around that. Like I would choose Bitcoin like to, today. That's what I kind of also mean with like okay, if, if he is successful with getting the framework really friendly around uh, free currencies, um, that would be. I, I think that could be good. Of course, we still need education. We still need the merchants to accept it. We still need a lot of work to be done but it could it could be the the start of something really cool i i hope so at least yeah yeah uh, maybe now it's uh, interesting to see that some people from europe and people from the united states are considering going to leave to argentina so I, i have never seen that in my life right but ever since this january friend told me hey uh, a bitcoiner friend is coming can you please show him around and Yeah, sure. And then, so we started going to barbecues, eating meat, right? Uh, and then another friend came, right? And then there was this Swiss guy, and then another friend. And pretty soon we were like a group of 10 people, right? Going around. And they were postponing the return ticket every week. They would they postpone it one week. And uh, Some started considering, hey, hey I, I could live here like six months per year and in two years I get an Argentine passport, right? Uh, it's a really low requirement. Like a lot of Russians now are going to Argentina to have babies and, and get an Argentine passport. Right? We're getting full of Russians. Uh, even some Americans are, are going to Argentina. So that that's blowing my mind, like Americans trying to have an Argentine passport. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, crazy world. Like, I also like, uh, I have a friend of mine who uh, is coming from Austria to Argentina. And he, and when I told him like, oh yeah, like I'm like, Argentina is one of my countries that is on my list where like, if, if Austria goes south that I consider going to. Uh, and, right. and he's like, why, why do you want to go to Argentina? <laughs> He was completely yeah. like, like, uh, I just, I, I came here to Austria to find better po possibilities. And now you have, you are in Austria, you have better possibilities and you want to go to Argentina. Now, like, I see something in Javier Melea, I see something in the policies and there might be something positive. Like, uh, obviously now, um, m maybe not right now, uh, because now there's a lot of uncertainties still there. But what if that continues the way where Javier Millet and, and that uh, political view of Javier Millet is successful. Uh, and then other countries like the EU uh, and the Americans uh, driving this Kamala Harris, Biden uh, economics <laughs> uh, style, yeah. then a lot of people can come to Argentina. If Kamala wins, yeah, it's a, like, I would say a no brainer, like, right? If people should go to Argentina. If Trump wins, I know Trump, I, I was in Nashville at the conference and he seemed uh, a little upgraded from the first Trump. So now he's surrounding himself with libertarians, right? So this, uh, this hasn't happened before, right? Uh, he's paying more attention to like a Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, the Winklebrost brothers, Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, right? So he gave this speech. Of course, he 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 got fed a speech, right? So somebody wrote the speech for him. But uh, yeah, it's changing. Especially Kennedy gave a tremendous speech, and Kennedy set up the bar really high, right? It's like Kennedy. He said, after two years of being in this crypto world, he's now starting to get it, right? He's now starting to get why Bitcoin and not crypto. And, and he gave a lot of things like, well, remo removing capital gains tax and making uh, transactions between dollar and Bitcoin irreportable, like that by law, you, you don't have to report it, right? So those two things uh, really open up everything. Right, it will be sort of what 
I'm not sure if it's even better than, than Millet. <laughs> but uh, so it's crazy to see uh, America going that way, right? Even both of them. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure if it was Trump, but also trying to build this stash for, for the US government of Bitcoin, like a strategic reserves. Yeah, for example, Javier hasn't said that, right? Javier has never so far mentioned that. So yeah, if Europe continues down this downward path and Kamala Harris wins, yeah, Argentina and very few other places are like a, a beacon of hope, right, to, to go there. But I, I should also warn people that the Argentine economy is being destroyed in comparison. So you might experience an upswing and that means growth. But so you can experience some economic growth, but uh, the size of the businesses is, is, is much smaller. Like uh, you won't find as, as many rich clients to do business with. Uh, the average person doesn't have much money. Right. So, so, so yeah, there's like a, yeah, like a trade off there. Like you, you may be able to ride the upswing perhaps on the stock market or on buying real estate uh, or whatever, but don't expect to perhaps make the deals that you were making in Europe or, or the United States. Like you won't have you won't such have a develop, uh, you, you won't have like a Silicon Valley. <laughs> in Argentina so yet if you want you can build it but, but there's no capital market for venture capitals that is significant right so yeah it, it might be uh, interesting for for remote businesses like even my podcast because uh, like I don't I, like I, I live in actually a quite expensive country and my income is not depending on Austria but Austria is, has like one of the highest um, uh, expenses. I mean, yeah, there's like Sweden that is more expensive. There's Swiss that is more expensive. There are some other countries that are more expensive than Austria, but uh, it is on the higher end of, of uh, your, your living expenses. So like uh, I myself, for example, would benefit from um, a lower cost of living country where it's still safe, where it's still like, <laughs> like uh, where it's still good to, to be there. Uh, so that well, could be an interesting thing. Yeah, if your income is uh, independent of location, like digital nomads, uh, it's a good uh, idea. Some parts of Argentina aren't as safe, let's say, right? Uh, you would have to go yeah, to little cities or little towns to be as safe as Europe, right? Uh, but well, I, I've been traveling around Europe with uh, Bitcoinetta, which is a van, right? Uh, we have the t-shirt here, Bitcoinetta, <laughs> the little van. But you realize it's so much safer, right? Uh, it took me a few months. In Argentina, you're always expecting, at least in the Buenos Aires city, like somebody to steal your phone, right? So you have to always be wary of where's my phone, uh, like, because... In the city, in the, in the main city, they perhaps they, they snatch it, right? But if you start going towards outside of the city, uh, the capital, it becomes more violent. So it becomes like, I bring a gun, right? Give me the phone, right? Or people, they get approached by people on motorbikes, right? Two people, whenever you're entering your house or leaving your house and they want your car, right? Or they want to steal what's in your house and so on. So yeah, it's not as safe as Europe, right? If you find yeah, some locations in the country where you're either in a good neighborhood or you're in a little town, yeah, no nothing perhaps goes on there, right? But but yeah, it's not the same in, in that regard. It's not as bad as what El Salvador used to be, or some other countries in Central America. But you have to keep it in mind, right? Uh, like I have to protect my belongings, my laptop, my DSLR camera, uh, and so on. Because these things, remember, Argentina has so much high, high taxes still that 
an iPhone like this new one would be like 1500 1500 right and the salary is 300 per month so this is five months of salary right for a person and that's why there's this incentive to to steal a phone right um, but well there are benefits like the meat is super good and cheap like at some times when it went the lowest you you, you might be able to buy a kilo of sirlo of loin or ribeye for like five dollars a kilo right you will you will have a whole, a whole kilo of really good meat and some other cuts will be even like three dollars a kilo <laughs> Now Argentina is becoming more expensive because as Javier is trying to make Argentina a normal country again, uh, the prices will, they're, they're rising in, in dollar terms, right? It's not as cheap. I remember last year I went in November and I was able to fill the gas tank of the car for $12. Uh, a few months later, it would take three times as much dollars, 36, to fill the car. Now, 36 is still cheaper than Europe, but for an Argentine that is making pesos, uh, having to pay three times as much in dollars, it's tough, right? So, so yeah, th those kind of situations are always going on. People are always trying to have, having to figure out how to survive Right, and speculating, oh, should I buy dollars, should I sell dollar, uh, should I wait and not pay my, my bills until next month, and they're always like this, right, having to develop a, like a master's degree in finance <laughs> in order to survive, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's what Bitcoin brings. Like, you don't have to have a massive risk squeeze. Uh, thank you so much already. Like, it, this was an uh, extremely nice insight in in Argentina uh, and, and what's going on there. Um, unfortunately, like we're already uh, <laughs> over our time. I think we, we can make it very long. We can even make a series about that. Um, but uh, we definitely have a, a second round. I would say. But we have now the end routine where you have two questions uh, that is always the same. The first question is, what can we learn from you besides all the things uh, that we already talked about? Well, uh, about me personally, or <laughs> about Bitcoin. Um, well, we, we are doing a, a tour of Europe with uh, a Bitcoinetta, which is a van, right? You can follow it if you want on, on Twitter, La Bitcoinetta. It's at Bitcoinetta EU. Uh, so the idea is to do meetups, uh, small conferences, teach people about Bitcoin, right? Uh, do evangel evangelism, spreading the good word. And recently, because of I got this idea in Munich, uh, I realized people in Europe didn't know much about Argentina. So I got this idea to write a book. So I did this Bitcoin prophecy and I got the Argentine flag in there. And, and it's also about Bitcoin. So, so yeah, this book is still not available on Amazon, but I'm traveling throughout the conferences. And like if you're going to, I know, a Lugano, Plan B Forum, or the, the, there's going to be a, a few conferences, well, I have it there uh, and you can get it. So yeah, and you can follow me on Twitter as well. I'm Ariel Aguilar in, in Twitter. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, perfect. Then next question. Uh, this is the end routine question where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Uh, and the question is a really interesting one because he's asking, explain whatever your expertise in Bitcoin is to a five year old. So basically <laughs> explain the situation uh, in Argentina uh, to a five year old one. Stuff. Well, you have to tell him what money is, I guess. So you you can tell him that money is what you use to get the things you want when you go to the candy store or when you go to the toy shop, right? People want uh, the money in order to give you something in return. And that person that takes the money will use it to pay for his food and his house and whatever he wants, right? 
So we are all moving uh, this uh, thing around or this money around and, and paying and, and choosing what we want, right? So now that I somewhat explained the, the key to what a money is, I would say now there are like bad monies and good monies, right? The bad money is a money that like, a, yeah, it would, it would, you know, I'm not sure if I, the word destroyed, <laughs> you will get it. But uh, for example, today you can buy two toys, but in one month you can only buy one toy, right? So that is no good. You want a, a money that at least can always buy you three toys, the same amount of money, right? And if the to if the money through as time goes on and you are six years old, in one year you will be six. If the money can purchase you four toys instead of three, it's better for you, right? So why would you choose the money that each month gives you less toys? You can you 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 are allowed to choose the the money give, that gives you the more the more toys. So you can also learn and decide for yourself: Do you want three toys now, or do you want four toys in a year? Right? <laughs> What's can you can you wait for a year and get four instead of three? Well. You have to choose. Most likely, he will say no. I want three toys now, and uh, you can start playing, right? Well, would you want ten toys in a year, <laughs> fifty toys in a year, and so on, right? So yeah, that, this is how I would try to explain him, and I would say, yeah, the the money that gives you the more th toys in the future is Bitcoin. That's it. <laughs> Amazing. I, 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 I laughed a lot. Uh, perfect. And yeah, thank you so much for, for being on, uh, Ariel. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.